In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for your people. Thank you for the desires you have given us. And for this great ministry you've given your people. I'm asking, Lord, that this work will prosper in our hands together in Jesus' name. We we'll pray you remove discouragement. You remove idleness. And you remove fruitlessness in Jesus' name. I pray that the power to bear fruit, you give to every one of our leaders in Jesus' name. We we'll pray, Lord, the fire to keep on burning, to be passionate, and to be compassionate to you and to be fervent for the lord give to every brother every sister in jesus name as you're using us to bless your church you bless each and every one of us that lord there'll be no lack in any one of our lives that all the desires of your people you will fulfill to the letter in jesus name once again bless us tonight and use us as a channel of blessing to people we're going to touch in Jesus mighty name we pray amen. Give me another amen. amen Praise the Lord God bless you, you can see I'm happy to be together once again Are you happy you are here today? And today you will not go back home empty and dead in Jesus name The Lord is praying for you We are all praying for you And all that God wants to accomplish in your life it will accomplish in Jesus' name. We're coming to First Peter chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 8. It says, Finally be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful and be courteous, that not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, and ye that ye shall receive or inherit a blessing, you will inherit your blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no girl, no deception. It says, let him eschew evil, forsake evil, abandon evil, abstain from evil and let him do good and let him seek peace and ensue each and pursue peace then it says in verse 12 for the eyes of the lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their to their prayers then he tells us now the other side but the face of the face of the lord is against them that do evil and who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good, no harm will come your way. Amen. I'm reading to verse 14. It says, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer. To every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evil doers, they may they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. I've read all that long passage to you to tell you what we're going to talk about today. The high calling of working for the king. The high calling of working for the king. It is a great privilege as well as a great responsibility to work for the great king. Everything about God, everything about the king of heaven and earth, the king of angels and saints, everything about him, the king of the holy city, everything about him is great and glorious. When you think about God, you think about God in different perspectives. But tonight we're looking at God as the king, the king of kings, 
and the great king and the glorious king and that you are called into service to serve the king of kings and to serve the great king of heaven what a privilege and what a responsibility that is it tells us in revelation chapter 15 verse 3 revelation chapter 15 we're looking at verse 3 see how this passage refers to god god almighty god the king of saints and the king of angels it says in revelation chapter 15 verse 3 and he sing the song of moses the servant of god and the song of the lamb saying great and marvelous either are thy works lord god almighty then it says just and true are thy ways tell me the rest there thou king of saints so you understand is the king of saints the king of heaven and earth the god of heaven and earth and the king of saints so as you think about yourself working for the lord you're actually doing the work of the king the work of the king workers in the church workers in the city of the great king because uh, that does uh, how the church is referred to if you come to uh, psalm 48 psalm 48 referring to the people of god in the old covenant and also under the new covenant it tells us in psalm, one, in psalm 48 verse 1 great is the lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our god in the mountain of his holiness beautiful for situation the joy of the whole earth is mount zion on the sides of the north the city of the great king you're thinking of the characteristics of god is great and glorious and because it's a great king you want to count the work you're doing for the lord as a great work and in the church it's referred to as the city of the great king and as you look at the church like that you know that to even serve in the church and to serve the people of god to serve the saints of the king is a great privilege indeed in fact it says that we are the servants of the god of heaven and earth you serve a god you serve a king you serve a master who owns the whole of the universe and is referred to as the god of heaven and earth we're looking at ezra chapter 5 ezra chapter 5 looking at how god is referred to here ezra chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 11 ezra chapter 5 verse 11 thus and thus returned us and sustained we are the servants of the god of heaven and earth we are the servants of the god of heaven and earth when you look at yourself in these pictures the servants of the most high god the servants of the god of heaven and earth and the servants of the church of the living god or the servants of the king of saints you look at yourself in that perspective then you begin to get have an understanding of who you are the great position and the great privilege the lord has given you and the king's expectation of workers in his house the king's expectation of workers in his temple the king's expectation of the workers in his city in his vineyard are clearly outlined in the manual that is given to us the manual that's the holy bible that's the book the word of god it tells us what a christian will be it tells us what a servant of god will be it tells us what a worker will be it tells us what you as a brother as a sister you are working for the lord what kind of person what kind of man what kind of woman you are supposed to be and you must understand every time this is the high calling of working for the king there are three things we're going to briefly look at number one the character of satisfactory workers for the king the character of satisfactory workers for the king uh, we, there's a kind of a work we do that is satisfactory that god will say that's good i'm happy with that i'm well pleased with that and when he's well pleased with our service with our work then his blessings will come upon us the character of satisfactory workers for the king number two now is the casting away of sinning workers by the king he comes to look at the workers he comes to examine the workers and he looks at us at home 
He looks at us on the street. He looks at us in schools. He looks at us in communities where we are. And if he sees that we are sinning workers, not just that we are sinful, we are sinning. We make sinning a practice. We make sinning a habit. We make sinning something we do from day to day. It's like we don't know who we are. And we do not know who we are serving. And because we do not know who we are and who we are serving, that's how we act like other people. Other people, those who serve the government, they say where they ought to be, they say where they ought to live. And the people that are serving some VIPs in the world, very important personalities in the world, they say where they behave. There's a way they live. And when we are serving the most high God, and we're serving him, the great king of heaven and earth, and we're serving the king of saints and the king of angels, there's a kind of life we ought to live. But if we do not live that life and we're sinning workers, there is a casting away of sinning workers by the king. Number three, the consecration of sanctified workers unto the king we consecrate ourselves we devote ourselves we commit ourselves we yield ourselves we surrender ourselves to the king he is the king and we are the subjects and because the king is high is holy is heavenly and because of this we totally completely or reservedly totally commit ourselves to the lord and is happy with that when our hearts are sanctified when our hearts are circumcised and when we're holy through and through we're pure within and we're pure without and we are holy unto the lord in the day in the night in the private in the public we're transparently holy and pure the lord loves that because his nature is the nature of holiness so you have the consecration of sanctified workers unto the lord i'm coming to number what's number one over there the character of satisfactory workers for the king uh, to start with let us say uh, uh, let's look at uh, matthew chapter 15. matthew chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 13. matthew chapter 15 we're looking at verse 13. it says in matthew chapter 13 verse chapter 15 verse 13 it says but he answered them he answered and said Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted, tell me what follows, shall be rooted up. You know what he's saying? He's talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Those are the people that planted themselves into the service of the Lord. The Lord had not called them. The Lord had not chosen them. The Lord had not appointed them because they were sinners. Because they were evil people, they were wicked people, they rejected Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and they planted themselves in the service of the Lord. And the Lord assured us and assured them, every plant, every worker, that the heavenly Father has not planted, has not appointed, shall be rooted out and rooted up, shall be cast away. That means then, if you are going to really do a satisfactory work in the kingdom of God, you must belong to the Lord. You must must have been born again you must have been a real child of god there must be that assurance of salvation praise the lord i'm saved and the spirit must be a witness here with your heart that you are a child of god that you are born again without that testimony of the spirit and without that conversion that you have in your heart there's no way the father will plant you and say you are a sinner go and minister to the saints impossible you are a child of satan go and minister to the children of God. You are in the world. You are worldly. Go and minister to the people that are uncompromising in the world. Impossible. Look at the next verse there. It says in verse 14, let them alone. They be blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. He's talking about the people who are blind. They are blind to eternity. They are blind to the grace of God. They are blind to the calling of God in their lives. The blind cannot be given the privilege of leading the children of God, of serving in the Lord, of the deaf. Those who are deaf to the voice of the Lord, they are deaf to the voice of the Spirit. They never hear. They are deaf to the message of repentance. They are deaf to the message of righteousness and holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. If you are blind, 
or you are deaf, deaf to the call of God and deaf to the voice of the Spirit, you cannot be a worker. Or if you are a leper, a leper is somebody who is uh, kind of uh, excluded from the household of faith. A leper, a person who is defiled, a person who is depraved, a person who is corrupt, a person who is sinful, a person who has not been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, or the defiled. The defiled cannot touch the holy things of God, cannot touch the holy instruments of God, or the abominable. The abominable. When God says that that person is an abomination unto me, that individual is an abomination unto me, there's no way he will put you in the work of the Lord if you are blind. If you are deaf, if you are a leper, if you are defiled, if you are the abominable one, if you are Satan's stooge, Satan's slave, Satan's emissary, Satan's followers, you have the nature of Satan. Jesus said, you have your father the devil, and the works of your father will you do. You cannot with one hand do the work of God, with the other hand do the work of Satan. If you are for Satan, you are not for God. If you are for God, you are not for Satan. And if you are Satan's servant, or Satan's slave, that he lives in you, he controls you, he directs you, and he kind of uh, forces you to do whatever he wants you to do. A slave of Satan cannot be a worker in the vineyard of the Lord, or if you are dead, dead, dead in sins and trespasses, there's no way that, you know, you're still living in sin, you're not even conscious of sinful. Because you are dead, you don't have any feeling, you don't have any conviction, any pain of offending the Lord. The dead cannot have satisfactory service or work for the living God, for the great God of heaven who is righteous, who is pure, and who is holy. Examine yourself. Are you born again? There must be conversion. That's the very first thing that happens before you can have the character of a real servant of God, of a worker in the vineyard of the Lord. There must be holiness. God is holy. The Bible is holy. It's the holy Bible. Heaven is holy. The angels are holy. And Christ is the holy son of God. And the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit. And because everything around God, around the king of saints is holy. So the people that serve him must have this as their watchword, as their experience. There must be holiness. Not only that should be thorough cleansing. Thorough cleansing. Not just that you are washed whitewash but you are washed and you are white on the snow in your mind in your heart in your life there is that cleansing with the blood of jesus christ that makes you pure in the sight of the lord only when that has happened conversion holiness a washing that makes you whiter than snow can you then render acceptable service to the high and holy king of heaven and earth to be acceptable and useful instruments in the hands of the lord you must be converted you must be clean you must be pure you must be holy you must be spiritual spirit filled and let's come back to first peter i'm reading from chapter three first peter chapter three we're talking now about the character the outcome the conduct of the person that has been converted is no more blind is no more deaf is no more a leper is no more defiled is no more an abomination before the lord and is no more there is no more a uh, satan's a slave and is no more dead is up is righteous is risen by the power of the risen christ walking in him there's a change there is a transformation it's a new creature in christ look at his character anywhere and everywhere Everywhere. In First Peter chapter three, verse eight. Finally, be ye all of one mind. Of course, there, there, there'll be no disagreeable spirit. There'll be no contrary spirit. There'll be no fighting. There'll be no wrangling because you know you're born again. Christ lives on this side of you. Christ lives on this side of him. Christ lives on, on this side of her. And if Christ lives within us, we'll be of one mind. There'll be no disagreement. There'll be no competition. There'll be no fighting. There'll be no strife between those who are working with the children or working with the youths or working with the campus or working with the women or working with the pastors or working with the languages. There'll be unity. But where you don't find that unity, there's a contempt. Tending spirit, 
there's a fighting spirit and there's a contentious kind of attitude there's something that always wants to you know be violent and wicked you know those are not workers in the vineyard those ones are working for themselves but if you are working for the lord it says finally be ye of, of one mind having compassion one of another uh, the compassion we're talking that the lord is talking about is not the compassion that somebody forces you to do something forces you to visit the sick forces you to visit the discouraged forces you to visit the people that are weak no any compassion that rises from your heart because christ is the christ of compassion he saw them and he had compassion on them if christ lives on the inside of you that doesn't say why if you're going to be a worker there must be that conversion and christ must live on the inside of you the compassionate christ must live inside you the sympathizing christ must live inside you and the loving christ must live inside you because it is that indwelling of christ within that makes you compassionate that makes you to love and you love as brethren be pitiful be courteous there'll be no rude attitude rude language there'll be no language that somebody will say why is he talking like that it's so rude it's so uncouth it's so kind of uh, it's like a beast look at the way he's talking and look at the things he's saying look at his attitude he doesn't have christ within and therefore the works of his father the devil will heed you the character of a satisfactory worker who is working for the king look at this not trying to doing evil for evil have you found uh, somebody says he's a worker that's what he says but it's not really working for the lord retaliation he did that to me i'm going to reply him he threw that at me i'm going to throw something at him hey, those, are, those are not christians those are not saints but you see the people who can bear whatever you do against them they bear persecution they bear misrepresentation and they bear their attacks or whatever you do against them and they're not rendering evil for evil have you found uh, you know how some people how they act they say you know the pastor or whoever did not do what we want him to do or what we expected he will do and because of that we're going to do this he will feel it he will know that you know we will not accept that those are not christians retaliation and the people that want to revenge and the people that misbehave because they have something to grind with another one it says the character of a real child of god and then the character of a christian worker is not the one returning railing for railing but contrary wise blessing knowing that ye are there unto called that ye should inherit a blessing i pray that nothing will take your blessing away from you and then it says in verse 10 for he that will love lie and see good days let him refrain his tongue from evil let him refrain you will put a check on your tongue it's not everything that shall cause to you that you will say you know sometimes you see a person and the person is uh, short not as tall as you expected it will occur to you the man is short you don't say that or maybe the man the woman is taller than you expected you don't say that you don't give voice to what comes in your mind if that thing will mean that will be rude that will be abusive that will be insulting that will make that man unhappy that will make him sad that will not encourage him you restrain yourself but the people that do not have any restraining ability anything that occurs to them they do anytime they want to shout they shout anytime they want to do whatever they do without thinking of how it will affect the person listening to them without thinking of how it will affect the people who are walking alongside with them then it goes on to say he refrains his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no girl his lips that they speak no girl 
no sin that resembles a lie. You think before you talk, and if you mistakenly say something that appears untrue, something false, something deceptive, something that looks like a lie, immediately you want to go back and correct that. It's even easier for us now. Because, you know, uh, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother, your sister has something against you, it says leave your gift there at the altar and go reconcile with him and then come back and offer your gift. You just remember that the thing I said wasn't the truth. There's a coloring there. There's an exaggeration there. There's a lie there. And you want to serve the Lord. And you are here at the house fellowship. You want to lead us fellowship. And all of a sudden it occurs to you. I told a lie. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to say that. You know, you leave your gift at the altar. You go to your friend. At that time there was no telephone. There was no cell phone. But now you have the cell phone in your hand. You don't have to, you know, travel a long distance. You don't have to write a letter. You can just call the person. Who is that? Oh, I'm um, so and so. You remember in the afternoon we were talking, I said this, I just realized that wasn't the absolute truth. And I feel pricked in my heart that I gave you an information that will mislead you. So I'm sorry about that. And you settle that, now you can go on with your house fellowship. You see, that's the character of the believer. But the person that will, you know, tell a lie and deceive and do whatever, and the other fellow has bought the lie, and you say, uh-huh, I deceived him. That's not a Christian. If you're a Christian, if you discover you've done something wrong, you've told a lie, or you've deceived somebody, it will cost you. want to correct it immediately. Look at verse, look at verse 11. Let him eschew evil. Let him deny evil. Let him abstain from evil. Anything that's an appearance of evil, you think... If you're a real Christian, if your mind is to go to heaven, if you know that you're a Christian worker and other people are looking at your example, you will eschew evil and you will do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Look for things that will make peace between you and your husband, between you and your wife, between you and your neighbors, between you and the people that interact with you. And it says, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. Every one of us should be, you know, praying. Because it says, we we'll pray without ceasing. That talks to everybody, members of the church and workers in the church. Workers in particular. And if you're going to be praying for other people in any way, Anyway, people request, would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? If you're going to pray effectively, it says the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. He wants us to live a life that will glorify him and lives that will make a God to be pleased with us and to answer our prayers. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading here from verse 19. It says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. That means it's not everybody saying, I'm a, I'm a church man, I'm a church woman, I'm born again, I'm a child of God. I am a worker, I am a preacher, I'm a leader. It's not everybody that God accepts. He says, God knoweth, the Lord knoweth his own. He says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, tell me what follows there, depart from evil. Do you make any conscious effort to depart from evil? Do you make any conscious effort to overcome temptation? Do you ever make any conscious effort to say that's evil coming, that's sin approaching, that's evil, and it's coming my direction. I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to depart from it. You see, those are the real children of God. They are conscious of the presence of God every time. They are conscious I'm a worker. And I want you to satisfactory work in the sight of the Lord. It says, let everyone, everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from evil. Look at verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from this, 
if a man therefore purge himself you know you take your bath in the morning every morning and it says the same way with a deliberate effort you wash your mouth every morning the same way with deliberate effort you will do this purge himself from these it shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and made for the master's use and prepared unto every good work ready for every good work prepared unto every good work because of the character of satisfactory workers a worker that knows that i'm working for the king of kings i'm working for the king of saints i'm working for the god of heaven and earth and because of that there must be a kind of life i will live there must be something i reject so that i can remain pure and holy and sanctified and acceptable in the sight of the lord look at verse 22 flee also youthful lusts flee also youthful lusts now when he says youthful lusts it's not just talking about young people of course young people not just talking about teenagers of course teenagers you remember that david was not a teenager when he saw that other woman Beersheba and then felt the lust and the temptation and fell into it that wasn't a teenager the thing that will make your body respond to sin like youths flee that's an action an action you take a stand you take that that thing is coming and you're not staying there and praying in jesus name in jesus name in jesus name oh lord don't let me fall and you're standing there you're not obeying the scriptures flee or maybe you just accidentally open something you open the internet and then all these things are coming as all those things are coming and you know this is evil this is bad if this thing grabs you and cuts you, it's going to drag you into evil. Flee. You close that thing. It came accidentally. And you are not going to continue watching that thing. That's how children of God, that's how they, have, they behave. The people that know I'm a worker. I want to be a satisfactory worker. And God is looking at me every time I flee. The things that corrupt me and the things that defile me. It says flee also youthful laws, but follow righteousness actively, purposefully, definitely deliberately diligently you follow righteousness and you follow faith and charity personally you make it a point of duty this is the way of righteousness i make a deliberate effort to follow it's not just okay i believe in holiness follow it actively deliberately diligently and say this is the way i'm going to live it says uh, you follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace with them uh, that call on the on the lord out of what kind of hearts there out of a pure heart out of a pure heart i said chapter third chapter six i said chapter six and i'm reading here from verse one i said chapter 6 verse 1 in the year that king Uzziah died i saw also the lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his throne filled the temple above its two the seraphim each of each one had six wings with twain he covered his face and with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly and one cried unto another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke and then look at the result now look at the reaction of isaiah then said i woe is me this man was a preacher then said i woe is me this man was a prophet then said i woe is me this man was a servant of god this man had been preaching if you look at chapters one to five he had been clearing the word of the lord but when he saw the glory of god when he saw the holiness of god and then he saw his own state of mind 
This is a person pursuing holiness. This is a person that wants to do satisfactory work for the Lord. Not just that he hears the message and he hears the word and then he shrugs his shoulder and then he goes his way. And no message ever affects him to actually want to diligently pursue the righteousness of the Lord. But then said, I woe is me, for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean leaves and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves, for mine eyes have seen the king my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar and he laid it upon my mouth because he cried to the lord because he requested from the lord because he prayed to the lord because he desired this holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Because he saw his condition and he said, I want to become somebody better. I want to become somebody holier. I want to become somebody who is totally free from any defilement. Because of that, there flew one of the angels and one of the seraphims with a live coal and touched his tongue. And it says, and laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away. This is a sanctification for Isaiah. And I sin purged, sin purged, iniquity taken away depravity taken away all the remnants of uh, evil in the heart taken away and everything purged and it was purified also i heard the voice of the lord saying whom shall i send and who will go for us then said i tell me here am i send me after sanctification here am i send me after the purging here am I, send me. After that, in what depravity, iniquity has been taken away. Has anything like that been done in your heart? Any sanctification? Definite time? Definite moment? Any purging? Definite time? Definite moment? A definite experience subsequent to salvation, after salvation, that the Spirit of God can bear witness in your heart now that you are deeper, you are higher, you are broader. You've gone further into the grace of God and you can tell the day it happened. You can tell the time it happened. You can tell the difference it made in your heart when your sin was purged, when that iniquity was taken away, when that depravity was handled and dealt with, and when you were sanctified and made holy in Christ and through through Christ. I pray it will happen in Jesus' name. And then we we'll come to Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33. I'm reading from verse 15. Isaiah chapter 33 verse 15. He that walketh righteously. These are the workers that satisfy the Lord, that please the Lord, that delight the Lord. The kind of worker, he'll say, I'm well pleased in you. He tells us in that chapter 33 and in verse 15, he that walketh continuously, he walketh continually, he walketh consistently, he that walketh righteously, not righteous today and sinful tomorrow, not righteous today and sinful in the office, not righteous when we're together like this and when you're all by yourself unrighteous but he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly he that despises the gain of oppressions that shaketh his hands from holding up bribes that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil it's just saying that it doesn't read anything or look at any picture that will defile him or to corrupt him. It doesn't hear anything from any source that will defile him, that will corrupt him. It doesn't rejoice with information or news that will make him unholy, make him unrighteous. Verse 16, it shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks. Bread shall be given him, his waters shall not shall be shown. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. 
Give me a good amen there. It shall behold the land that is afar off. See, those are the real children of God. Those are the real servants of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 52, I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 52, we're looking at verse 1. Awake, awake. It's saying, now that you have heard all this, and you have seen there are kinds of workers that God delights in. Do something about it. Don't allow leaders' meetings come and go. There's no change. All these services come and go. We hear a lot and we read a lot, and there's no change. It says, Awake, awake, and put on thy strength, O Zion, and put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Can I have an amen? amen. That means you shut the gate. You close the door that that thing that's abominable coming, no, it will not get here again. That thing that is sinful coming, it will not get here again. The things were allowed in the past because you are just careless. You just lived your life. You didn't know who you are working for. You didn't know the kind of character you ought to have. It says now you shut the door, you close that door, that that uncircumcised thing, that unclean thing will not come and shake thyself from the doors. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. The thing that made you captive before, that you know, they just heaped it on you, dumped it on you, you and you didn't resist at all it's like you are just flowing like a dead fish um, you know down the stream but now you say no I'm not going to allow that in my life anymore I'm awake and then I'm at a large. I'm not going to accept any sinful thing coming into my life again. And then it says in verse 7, look at verse 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring a good tidings, that publishes peace, that bring a good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, and that saith unto Zion thy God. God reigns. These are the preachers. Verse 8, thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. And it says in that verse 8, for well, the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. That's the unity. Eye to eye. Unity of faith. Unity of message. Unity in doctrine. Unity in revelation. It's not like, I don't agree with that. Then you don't see eye to eye. I'm not going to go along with that. You don't see eye to eye. I'm not going to follow that message. Then you don't see eye to eye. It says thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, one voice. And then we, it says together will they sing one song. And they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Look at verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out. From thence, touch no unclean thing. Anything that will make you unclean. Anything that will defile your life. Anything that will soil your garment. Anything that will make you unrighteous, make you unholy. Anything that would have the tendency of making you backslide. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean. Tell me. That bear the vessels of the Lord. You bear the vessels of the Lord. Whatever work you are doing in the kingdom of God, you bear the vessels of the Lord. It says, be ye clean. I pray you'll be clean. Yeah. Let, let's see the people that say they were doing the work of God and then they were not clean in the sight of God. He judges them. Leviticus chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 1. Leviticus chapter 10, we're looking at verse 1. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1. And neither but Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them a censer and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered what? And offered, tell me out loud, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Any doctrine which he commanded not, a strange doctrine. Any worship which he has not commanded, a strange worship. Any mode of prayer, prayer warriors. Any mode of prayer, pray for me, pray for me. Any mode of prayer that he has not commanded, a strange prayer, strange 
manifestation. Any kind of fire that he has not commanded, the strange fire. And it says over here, they offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them. And they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is it, that the Lord speaks, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come near me. And before all people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. I pray that if you've been offering strange fire, preaching strange doctrine, doing anything that is strange that the Lord has not commanded, I pray there will be a change. That the Lord will not have to bring judgment upon you in Jesus' name. Point number two now. The casting away of sinning workers by the king. We're looking at First Peter chapter 3. In First Peter chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 12. First Peter chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Would you know that God inspects the work? He inspects the workers. He examines the workers. And whatever work we're doing, the section leader may not be there. The local pastor may not be there. But God is watching. And he looks at everything. And he sees everything. You remember when Ananias and Sapphira came, they didn't know that God was watching them. But we can tell God was watching and as Judas as God did what he went to do, he didn't know that the Lord was watching, but the Lord was watching. The Lord is watching you. In the dark, in the open, in the secret, in the public. And because he's watching you, and you say you're a worker, you say you stand for him, you say you represent him, his eyes follow you everywhere, his ears listen to the conversations you hold directly on the phone. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord, tell me, is against them that do evil. The sinning worker is graceless. The sinning worker is godless. It's a plant not planted by the Lord. He will be rooted out. A fruitless tree covering the ground will be cut down very soon, professing to work for God while in reality serving Satan. He will be driven away to Satan's eternal habitation. Put away from among you among yourselves, that wicked person. That's the commandment of scripture. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 13. It says, But them that are without God judges, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Somebody says he's a worker, but he's a liar. Put him off. He says, I'm a worker, but he's a fornicator, an adulterer, and you know it. Don't tolerate them. That's what the Bible says here. Paul, the apostle to all the Corinthian church, get away that wicked person, sinful person, sinning worker from among you. Cast him away. Somebody says he's a worker, and he's a giving bribe and taking bribes. He's covetous. He has the love of money. It's like Achan. The word of God says, Cut them off, put them away, like Achan, like Jezebel, like Cain, like Balaam, like Korah, like Ananias and Sapphira, like Judas Iscariot, like Simon and the like. They have neither part nor lot in this matter, in the ministry, for their heart is not right. In the sight of God. Uh, let, let's look at uh, Second Kings chapter twenty-three. 
2 Kings chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 24. And what these uh, good kings did is what the leaders in the church will do. What the pastors in the church will do. What overseers will do. We don't allow people to stay in the work of God, remain in the vineyard of the Lord, destroying the work. People in the church lead bad example. And they say they're walking. And they're not living the life of righteousness. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. The fellow is not living a new life, he's living, living the old sinful life, a life of depravity, a life of defilement, a life of wickedness, a life of godliness. And then he's saying, I'm a worker. If you're a leader and you know such a person, you put them aside. Look at this. In 2 Kings chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 24. 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 24. It says, uh, moreover, the workers will tell me, familiar spirits, and the wizards, and the images, and the idols, and all the abominations that have was spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, did Josiah put away Put away, put away those workers, sinning workers, those workers, the people that are dabbling into paths of darkness, into occultism, into gang, gang, gangsterism, into wickedness and violence. He says, He put them away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that he hired the priest found in the house of the Lord. Look at verse 25 and like unto him like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses neither after him arose there any like him single yourself out that you will not compromise with sin you will not compromise with evil. And you will not compromise with compromisers and evil doers. Get rid of them from the work of the Lord. We're looking at Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34. And I'm reading from verse 22. Job chapter 34 verse 22. It says, there is no darkness, no shadow of death, where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Sometimes uh, they hide, they do evil behind the curtain. They do evil and they cover it with some particular action. But in the sight of God, they cannot hide themselves, for he will not lay upon man more than right, that he should enter into judgment with God. It shall break in pieces mighty men without number And set others in their stead That is those who are mighty but they are sinning He gets rid of them And then he replaces them With those who are truly saved Those who are sanctified Those who are holy Those who are righteous And those who are rendering satisfactory service unto him Therefore in verse 25 He knows their works And he overturneth them in the night So that they are destroyed. He striketh them as wicked men in the open sight of others. He rebukes them in the sight of other people. You don't uh, discipline the people secretly and people don't know what they have done. If they are adulterers and fornicators, get them out of the work because that's what the word of God commands, whoever they are. Somebody is so, he feels I'm so useful. Somebody says I'm so indispensable. Somebody says I'm this and that. And he's not indispensable in holiness, in righteousness, in sanctification. But he's, so, he's indispensable in activity. But he's living in sin. When you know about it, you're not going to go along with them. You remove them, whoever they are. And then it says in verse, in verse 27, because they turned back from him and would not consider any of his ways so that they 
caused the cry of the poor to come unto him and he heareth the cry of the afflicted when he giveth quietness who then can make trouble and when he hideth his face who then can behold him whether it be done against a nation or against a man only that the hypocrite reign not that the hypocrite reign not lest the people be sneered in a church where you want to preach the whole of the bible where you want to lead sinners to salvation where you want to lead those who are saved unto sanctification and where you want to prepare people for heaven there's no allowance for hypocrites to be there and to be hiding there to be saying they are the preachers a hypocrite is preaching salvation who is going to get saved a hypocrite is preaching sanctification who is going to get sanctified a hypocrite is trying to prepare people for heaven who is going to get ready for heaven that's why it says over there in verse 30 that the hypocrite reign not lest the people be sneered surely it is me to be said unto god that is when you discover yourself when you discover that it's like you've not lived the life satisfactory to the lord you've been in one way or the other compromising you have been back you have your backsliding it says you will say to the robber statue well, surely it is me to be said unto god i have born chastisement i will not offend anymore i've discovered this lord i'm sorry i've discovered that lord i'm sorry i've discovered that lord i'm sorry and then it says that which i see not teach thou me if i have done iniquity tell me i will do no more shout it out i will do no more the places I've gone and I discovered I shouldn't have gone there, I will do no more. Tell me out loud. And the dresses I've worn, that's not, that's not befitting to a real child of God. I will do it no more. Tell me out loud. And the things I've touched and the places that I've, you know, kind of roamed about, I just discovered that that's not all right for a saint. That's not all right for a real child of God. I will do no more, everybody. Let that sink into your subconscious, sink into your heart, and sink to your life. That from today, there will be a definite difference in your life from today, from the past. That things will be totally different. That I can do no more. That I can say no more. That I can drink no more. That I can eat no more. There I can go no more. Because now I discover myself, I'm a unique, specially selected and chosen worker in the vineyard of the Lord. And those evil things will not have any part in your life in my life anymore in jesus name i'm looking at some five i'm reading from verse four some five and in verse four remember we're looking at the fact that he casts away he puts off the sinning workers from his kingdom and from his work in some five we're looking at verse four for thou art not a god that has pleasure in wickedness is not a god that has pleasure in fornication pleasure in adultery pleasure in stealing pleasure in violence pleasure in wickedness neither shall evil dwell with thee the foolish shall not stand in thy sight the people are foolish the people who go back into sin the people who do evil and the people who backslide and remain in that backsliding, it says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Look at chapter 7, verse 11. Chapter 7, verse 11 of the Psalms. God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked. Read everything. God is angry with the wicked every day. Say that. You know, somebody says he's a prayer warrior and he's wicked, he's sinful, he's backsliding, he's rigid in his sinning, deliberate in his sinning. And God is angry with the wicked every day. And a fellow says he's a prayer warrior, he wants to lay hands on you, remove your head from there. Because God is not going to answer his prayer. The Lord is angry with the wicked every day. Somebody says, you know, he's a chorister, he's a singer, instrumentalist, living in adultery, fornication. He wants to sing, 
get him out of that place get her out of that place if god is angry with that lady if god is angry with that man the singing is the song of a sinner and god is angry with that singer and god is angry with that singing it's not going to be of any use god is angry with the sinner with the wicked every day somebody says to the preacher what's the wicked man going to preach a backslider what's he going to preach and you are there that lady you know that this man is committing something with you and he still did it you know recently and now he's opening the bible praise the lord today we're going to look at the bible and you are sitting there and you are the same partner to that preacher God is angry with the wicked every day. It's not going to preach anything that is going to be of any use to the kingdom of God or to the people of God. And you know it. Let the pastor know. Let the leaders know. And then we get him out of that pulpit so that he will not preach and then go to hell from the pulpit there. Look at Psalm 7 verse 11. Everybody, we're going to read together. If you believe the word of God, you read it out aloud. Let me hear you. One, two, three, go. Everybody say amen. amen. Read that again. Another amen. amen. Read it for the last time. Amen. You know, if you are wicked, God is no respecter of persons. A man, a woman. I say you are a worker. You say you are a leader. You say you are a preacher. God is angry with you. And the only way you can be useful in the kingdom of God, go back to Calvary and go back to the cross and say, Lord, I know I'm not living right. I know my life is terrible. I know that in the private behind the curtain, this is the way I'm living. And I know that because of my wickedness, I'm destroying the church. I know you're angry with me. I want your favor. And the Lord will forgive you and cleanse you and change your life in Jesus. Jesus name. I'm looking at Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 21. Amos. Amos chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 21. He wants all the people that bear the name of the Lord. All the people that do the work of the Lord. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to be free from sin. He wants us to be the real children of God. And then our service for the Lord will be acceptable in his sight. We're looking at Amos chapter 5 verse 21. I hate, I despise your feast days. And I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs. For I will not hear the melody of thy viols of thy violin. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. It says what he's looking for is righteousness and justice. If there is wickedness, it says, all that singing is noise, it's rubbish in the sight of the Lord. All the playing of instrument, musical instrument, if there is sin, if there is evil, if there is no humility, if there's no righteousness, if there's no holiness, it says it's a waste of time. It's worse than a waste of time because it's not going to accept it. And as we approach the Lord and we come sincerely and we say, Lord, look at my hand, look at my life, and look at the things I've been doing. I'm sorry. And then you are cleansed in the blood of the Lamb and you are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And your life is new and your life is righteous. Then you can come and offer your gift. You can come and offer huh? whatever you have to offer. It is that that will make your service acceptable. And I pray that the Lord will give us uh, the heart to be obedient to the word of the Lord. And we will do what the Lord has called us to do. He will cleanse us. 
he will touch us he will make us sanctified workers and righteous workers and holy workers that are depend that are totally dependent on him and yielded unto him in jesus name we're looking at point number three now that is the concentration the consecration of sanctified workers unto the king those who are committed to the lord committed unto the king we're coming back to first peter chapter three first peter chapter three and i'm reading from verse 13 first peter chapter three verse 13 and who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good followers of that which is good that's what he wants of us that's what he expects of us that it will be followers of that which is good not that which is evil but in verse 14 but and if you suffer for righteousness sake happy are ye happy are ye and there are people today that do not understand you might suffer for righteousness you might be persecuted for righteousness once there's a little pain once there's little suffering because of standing for righteousness then they give up they're discouraged they cannot live a righteous life anymore because they say i try to follow the word of god i try to demonstrate the christian experience i have but instead of being uh, appreciated i was persecuted maybe i will not do that anymore they get easily discouraged but the word of god says but and if you suffer for righteousness sake happy are ye i said happy are ye be not afraid of their terror neither be troubled but sanctify the lord but honor the lord but reverence the lord but set apart the lord god in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear look at verse 16 tell me the first line there having a good conscience having a good conscience having a good conscience you know if you're going to serve the lord acceptably you cannot be carrying a heavy conscience about a guilty conscience about and every time we reach the bible every time the pastor mentions adultery fornication your heart will beat your heart will caught you cannot be serving god like that every time we mention stealing stealing church money your heart will caught because you know you're a rogue you're a robber you're 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 thief you're stealing church money every time we talk about telling lies your heart will caught your conscience is not right your conscience is not clean your conscience is not clear every time we talk about uh, you know any appearance of evil you remember something and your heart will caught you're not enjoying uh, the message you're not enjoying the preaching you're not enjoying sound doctrine sound doctrine is a trouble for you sound doctrine is like a uh, pinching you and pricking you every time because you don't have a clear conscience why don't you go to calvary why don't you go to christ why don't you go to the cross of jesus christ and settle it once and for all so that we can read any part of the bible we can read the whole bible and your heart will say amen praise the lord your heart will not cut anymore your conscience will not be guilty anymore it says if you're going to serve the lord this is a consecration this is a commitment having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in christ we're looking at acts of the apostles chapter 24 acts of the apostles chapter 24 and i'm reading here from verse 15 acts chapter 24 verse 15 it says and have hope toward god which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead both of the just and the unjust look at verse 16 and herein do i exercise myself herein do i exercise myself to have to have to have always a conscious void of offense toward god and toward men you see paul the apostle he had a clear conscience he had a good conscience he had a free conscience 
And you know, if that man did not have a conscience clear and clean of any offense toward God and toward man, he will be burdened every time, heavy every time. As they persecuted him in Acts of the Apostle, chapter 13, his mind will caught. Maybe it's because of what my conscience is telling me. What I did that has not been resolved. What I did that has not been forgiven. Maybe it's what I did. Yes, that's why I'm having this. When he got to chapter 14 of Acts of the Apostles, and then they persecuted him, and they drove him away out of town. You know, if he wasn't living a life that is free, a life that is holy, that he is exercising always a conscience, word of faith toward God, a man, his heart will caught again. <laughs> this thing that is coming upon me every time, uh, is it because of this? Is it because of that? In chapter 15, as all those Judaizers came out, they wanted to scatter all the work he was doing, he'll be thinking, am I suffering for my sin? Am I suffering for that fornication? Am I suffering for that adultery? Am I suffering for that stealing? But because his mind was clean, his heart was clear. In Acts of the Apostle, chapter 16, he went to the, and they threw him in the dungeon of the prison, and he put his legs together, and then at midnight, he'll be thinking, hmm. Why is all this happening to me? Am I the only one? All the other apostles, it appears, everything is okay for them. But I get into trouble here. I get into prison here. I get somewhere there. If his mind was not clear, he'll be thinking, what's happening here? Why is this happening to me? But because he always exercised a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man, he himself and Silas could see. And as they began to sing at midnight, and then all the prison doors were open, and the foundations of the prison shaking, because that man had a clear conscience. I pray you'll have a good conscience. Clear conscience comes when, after you have remembered, look at this, look at this, look at that. I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of that. You settle it with the Lord at the foot of the cross at Calvary. And then you go to the people you have offended, people you stole from, and people you lied to, and people you changed some receipts ways, and you make right your way. You say, I'm sorry I did this. I was a backslider then. I did this. I was a sinner then. I did this. I didn't know what I was doing at that time. When you correct everything, you have a clear conscience before God, a clear conscience before man. Whatever happens after that, you can sing like Paul and Silas. And when you sing like Paul and Silas, miracles will take place in Jesus' name. A conscience void of offense toward God and toward man we're looking at second corinthians chapter four second corinthians chapter four i'm reading from verses one and two second corinthians chapter four verse one and two therefore seeing we have this ministry we have as we have received mercy we faint not i pray that you will not faint in the work of the lord in the assignment god has given you in this great ministry the Lord has put in our hands, you will not faint in Jesus' name. But it says in verse 2, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We renounced it. We rejected it. We refused it. We threw it away. That there will be no appearance of dishonesty in, in his life in their lives and if you do the same thing that anything of dishonesty you renounce not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of god deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of god commending ourselves to every man's conscience allowing the conscience of the people to judge and to evaluate whatever it is we're doing that conscience is very important we're looking at first timothy chapter one first timothy chapter one and i'm reading from verse five first timothy chapter one verse five now the end of the commandment the goal of the commandment the purpose of the commandment the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience 
That's the end. That's the purpose. That's the reason we're hearing the word of God. That's the reason the epistles have been given to us. It says so that we can have a good conscience and faith unfailing. Look at verse 6. From which some have been swerved, have turned aside unto vain junking. It says, when there's no good conscience, and turn away from good conscience, clear conscience, pure conscience, the rest is vanity. Whatever it is you think you're doing, you're singing, that's vanity without a good conscience. You're preaching, that's vanity without a good conscience. You're having activity, activity, project there, project there, that's vanity without a good conscience. I'm looking at verse 19 here. Holding, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck. You make a shipwreck of your profession if you are not having a good conscience. I'm looking at chapter three, chapter three, verses eight and nine. First Timothy chapter three, verse eight and nine. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, serious, witty. Not double tongued, not giving to much wine, not greedy or filthy lucre. Look at verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith. Tell me. The pure conscience. The pure conscience. A conscience that is not defiled or sin. A conscience that is not weighed down or sin. How is it that you are not weighed down or sin? Because you confess the sins to God and you've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and the person you offended and the person you stole from and the person you did anything wrong to you've gone to them you've made restitution you've settled your life you've settled your account with the Lord and with the people so you have a pure conscience Hebrews chapter 9 I'm reading from verse 14 Hebrews chapter 9 and we're reading from verse 14, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge, tell me, purge your conscience. Purge your conscience. The conscience needs purging with the blood of Jesus Christ. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We're looking at chapter 10, verse 22. Chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart, a full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. You see, it's all over in the New Testament. It wants our hearts to be free. Free from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us, uh, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching for if we sin willfully if we sin deliberately if we sin habitually if we sin deliberately after we have received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful fearful looking for of judgment and fair indignation which shall devour the adversary see that despised uh, moses lord died without mercy on the two or three witnesses of how much sorrow punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the son of god and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has not despite unto the spirit of grace for we know him that 
that said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord. Again, the Lord shall judge his people. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And then he goes on to tell us in verse, uh, in verse 36, in verse 36, For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, if any man draw back, anybody planning to draw back? If any man draw back, I will not draw back. I said I will not draw back. You'll not draw back from the message of holiness. You'll not draw back from the Christ of Calvary. You'll not draw back from the work the Lord has given you to do. You'll not draw back from the cleansing that he wants you to have. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto... Those who draw back, they draw back unto perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 16 But to do good and to communicate forget not For with such sacrifices God is well pleased Obey them that have the rule over you And submit yourselves for the word for your souls As they that must give account That they may do it with joy and not with grief For that is unprofitable for you Pray for us For with trust we have what? Tell me out loud. For we trust we have a good conscience. You're a preacher, you must maintain the good conscience. An apostle, you must maintain that good conscience. And you're a worker in the vineyard of the Lord. It's very important to maintain that good conscience. Pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience in all things. In all things. Willing to live honestly i pray that that kind of conscience the lord will give us in jesus name we're looking at first peter chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 here we're reading from verse 19 first peter chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 19 it says in verse 19 for this is thankworthy if a man what for conscience toward god conscience toward god you never contradict your conscience you never go against the voice of that conscience an enlightened conscience a spirit guided conscience a pure conscience a good conscience a conscience that is intent on not having seen in your life you never contradict that and if because of that because you want to be answerable to god and to that pure conscience if people persecute you if they say anything negative about you you endure because it says for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward god endure grief suffering wrongfully for what is it what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults ye shall take it patiently but if when ye do well and suffer for it you see that when you do well and suffer for it because the person you have been committing sin with you know he never imagined you break up from that sin the person you've been compromising with she never imagined you will break off from that compromise here is where i stand now i want to live a righteous life i want to live a holy life i want to live a life satisfactory unto the lord he cannot imagine that she cannot imagine that when you do well then you suffer for each that person might say okay i'll make you suffer for that you take it patiently this is acceptable with god for even here unto what ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Tell me the rest. That you shall follow his steps. I will follow the steps of Christ. I said, I will follow the steps of Christ. You will follow by his grace in Jesus' name. Serving God and walking in the vineyard of the great king is a serious matter. It cannot be done with levity. It cannot be done with carelessness. It cannot be done with hypocrisy. It cannot be done with light-heartedness. 
God is holy. His sons and servants must be holy. Our calling is high. Our calling is holy. Our calling is heavenly. Our conduct must match our calling. Our character must match our calling. Our consistency must match our calling. Our conviction must match our calling. Our courage, courage to live for Christ and courage to serve the Lord wholeheartedly and steadfastly. Our courage must match our calling. Our commitment must match the characteristic of the king we serve. The Lord has uh, enlightened us today as the kind of servants he wants, the kind of workers he wants, and the kind of leaders he wants. And it's now time for us to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I've heard the word. Lord, I've heard everything you demand. I want to live to satisfy you. I don't want to be a sinning worker, a sinful worker, a compromising worker, a backsliding worker. I want to stand firm, and I want to do the will of God in my my life oh lord cleanse me wash me white as snow purge me purify me sanctify me and make me be the person i ought to be that if every worker were to be like me there'll be a revival in the church there'll be a revival in deeper life there'll be a revival in the nation oh lord make me a beacon of light oh lord make me a mighty worker make me a standing worker make me a sanctified worker make me a yielded worker make me a kind of worker that lays everything on the altar I will not compromise anymore all the people that have been cringing with compromising with Lord compromise has come to an end I want to be holy I want to be righteous I want to be fervent I want to be faithful to the Lord oh Lord I want to serve you I want to be a worker you'll be pleased with I want to be a worker that satisfies you a worker that is turning many people to righteousness a worker that is turning many people to holy a worker that is even the conscience of other people a worker that has a pure conscience a good conscience a worker that has a clear conscience a worker that is faithful a worker that is open a worker that is a living the life in the open in the secret in the private in the public anywhere I find myself a worker that is worth a salt a worker that is serious minded a worker that is steadfast a worker that is committed a worker that is on the work and the fire of God is burning within my soul a worker that is holy a worker that is righteous a worker that is pure a worker that is heavenly a worker that is centered that centers his heart on the word of god on the calling of the lord a worker that's an example to other people a worker that is a model a worker that says oh lord all my heart all my mind every sin of god i lay upon the altar a worker that will not sin a worker that will not compromise a worker that will not fall a worker that will not cringe a worker that will not uh, you know do, do anything with other people don't let them hear don't let them hear i want to be a worker that is transparent i want to be a worker that with all my heart all my soul all my mind i want to serve the lord a worker that is really converted a worker that is consecrated a worker that is committed a worker that is sanctified a worker that is single-minded a worker that is going on my way to heaven and nothing will turn me back i want to stand i want to say a worker that is serious a worker that is serious and committed a worker that says oh lord here am i i want to serve you nothing will turn me back i've made i've made my choice nothing will turn me back i've laid my hands on the plow and nothing will turn me back i want to follow you i want to follow you i want to follow you follow you in righteousness follow you in holiness and follow you in commitment follow you in sanctification i want to follow christ until i get to heaven Follow Christ until I get to heaven. I'm not going to make the, this ministry cheap. I'm not going to make the work cheap. I'm not going to make it superficial. I'm going to follow the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. I want to lay everything upon the altar. I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. A worker with a pure conscience. A worker with a good conscience. A worker whose conscience is void of offense toward God and toward man. A worker in the night I'm there. In the day. I'm there. I'm fervent. 
I'm faithful. I'm, I'm not going to be superficial. I'm going to be deep. I'm going to be a deeper life walker. A deeper life walker. A deeper life walker. I want to be deep in the grace of God. I want to be deep in the godliness. I want to be deep in my conviction. I want to be deep in serving the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind. I just want to serve the Lord. Nothing will turn me back. 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 A woman will not lessen my consecration. A man will not lessen my consecration. A Jezebel will not lessen my consecration. A Delilah will not lessen my consecration. A Judas Iscariot will not lessen my consecration. A Simon the Sorcerer will not lessen my consecration. I will serve the Lord. 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 There's no turning back. I've made my choice. There's no turning back. I'll make I've made my choice. There's no, no turning back. I have made my choice. I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. Acceptable service. Acceptable service. Acceptable service. Acceptable service. Acceptable service. I want to render to the Lord until my last breath, until the last drop of the blood in my body. I'll keep on serving the Lord.